This is the Infotagen podcast, the vaccine to the disinformation virus. The mission statement of the Transatlantic Commission on Election Integrity states that election interference is a major threat to the universal right of people to take part in democratic elections. Still, the democratic governments and technology companies around the world are scrambling to meet the challenges of the latest election meddling tactics and technologies. I'm Damien Collins, and in this podcast, I'll be discussing the work of the Commission to safeguard elections in the digital age with its co-chairs, Anders Fogh Rasmussen, the former Prime Minister of Denmark and Secretary General of NATO, and Michael Chertoff, who was the United States Homeland Security Secretary for the second term of the presidency of George W. Bush. We'll also be hearing from our resident disinformation analyst, Dr. Charles Creel. Um, and this is uh, Fogg Rasmussen and Michael Chertoff. It's wonderful to have you with us on the Infotagent podcast. And I wanted to start our discussion really focusing on the work you've done in establishing the Transatlantic Commission for Election Integrity. I mean, that started in 2017, really as the world started to understand a little bit more about interference in elections. I'd be interested to know what the, where the inspiration for uh, the commission came from uh, at that time. Yeah, the inspiration actually came from uh, now President-elect Joe Biden. Uh, He uh, wrote an article in the foreign policy magazine, Foreign Affairs, uh, in the late uh, autumn of uh, 2017. Uh, He um, argued uh, that the Russian meddling into uh, the U.S. election in 2016 was a grave threat to democracy. So he suggested to establish a 9-11 like American commission. I called him, uh, said he would write, but I argued this is not only an American problem, but it's a transatlantic challenge. Uh, We have uh, faced with a number of uh, European elections and we are also concerned about Russian meddling into those elections. He agreed, so in um, uh, spring 2018, we established the Transatlantic Commission on Election Integrity. And um, typically for um, uh, Joe Biden, he insisted uh, that it should should be bipartisan. So he suggested uh, uh, a shared uh, uh, chairmanship, uh, so, I was uh, chairman on the European side and on the American side. He suggested uh, a Republican, uh, Michael Chertoff, uh, who is a former Homeland Secretary in the US. It was an ele- excellent way of doing things. Uh, and we have done a lot of activities since we started in the spring 2018. And was your, at the, at the start, I'm interested because of your role, not just as a former Prime Minister of Denmark, but as former Secretary General of NATO, and obviously Michael Chertoff, your experience as Homeland Security Secretary, right. is that looking at this is not just as, a, as an information issue, but a security issue uh, as well, that, that information warfare is in a way a, a form of cyber warfare and a, and a threat to democracies, um, as well as other threats exist. I think that's true. And, um, you know, if you look at some of the Russian military doctrine, there's a doctrine called the Gerasimov Doctrine, <clears throat> named after uh, one of their senior generals who gave a speech a few years ago, in which he made it clear that information is a domain of conflict. And that if you are able to undermine your adversary's um, cohesiveness and um, social trust, you actually undermine their unity of effort and you weaken their ability to resist other kinds of, of conflict. The Chinese have a similar uh, view as well, that information is an element of conflict. So um, I think that we recognize, if you go back historically, that um, certainly in this last decade, we were slow to, to appreciate the way in which these kinds of uh, tools would be used to advance a geopolitical agenda and to undermine our our societies. 
think um, I think that's important. And I mean, disinformation and election interference is uh, isn't necessarily a new thing. As we saw it during the Cold War, particularly uh, in Europe. But obviously, the internet and social media gives new possibilities uh, for that can be done cheaply uh, and easily. And how quick do you think we've been to understand the nature of that threat? I think we've been too slow. Um, until 2016, uh, we were not aware of this kind of new uh, warfare. Uh, and we have only gradually uh, adapted uh, to it. So what we considered one of the first tasks of uh, the Transatlantic Commission on Election Integrity uh, was uh, to raise awareness. That in itself is a very important instrument because if, if the people in a country is aware of the risk of foreign meddling, uh, then they will be more uh, resilient. So uh, we have uh, made public campaigns, we have, made, uh, we have organized meetings uh, for legislators on both uh, sides of the Atlantic uh, and actually, we also organized a joint session uh, in the U.S. Congress between European and American legislators. Uh, and um, the outcome of that was also a declaration on certain principles. So the very first task was to raise awareness. And I mean, I think that's what and I, I sort of feel that um, the discussions we've had on, on this podcast, some people say, well, looking at the problems going into the 2020 presidential election, how much has really changed since 2016? But I think the one thing that has really changed is we're much more aware of what we should be looking for and what we, sh what we should be afraid of than we, the, than we were four years ago. And I would say the social media companies, uh, I think this was brought more to the forefront of their awareness and that put pressure on them to begin to respond to what had been a deliberate effort to manipulate social media uh, to draw kinds of messages, and particularly manipulation using false fronts or automated systems that artificially affect uh, the ranking of particular types of stories. And so this was at least in, in part, I think, responsible for getting these social media companies to begin at least to remedy some of the exploitation by troll farms in St. Petersburg or um, bot, you know, botnets generated out of other parts of Russia. And the, when the commission was launched, I, th I think there was a particular focus on the elections to the European Parliament in 2019. And there was a considerable fear then that in elections that are historically quite low turnout elections, well, particularly in the UK, they, they were, um, that it's quite easy to interfere in an election like that, and there was a big concern over Russian interference. I mean, Anders, looking from the European side, I mean, do you think um, enough was done in advance of those elections to prepare for that threat? And is what happened what you expected would happen? Yes, we saw uh, clearly uh, Russian attempts to meddle uh, in, in the election. Uh, and uh, I don't think uh, the European Parliament had devoted uh, the sufficient resources to counter to counter that uh, meddling, uh, which uh, varied from country to country. Uh, they focused on the countries with the weakest um, uh, systems to, uh, to resist uh, that uh, meddling. But at the end of the day, I think from an overall perspective, we managed to carry out a uh, free and fair election without too much meddling uh, from the Russian side. One of the initiatives we took uh, from um, the Transatlantic Commission uh, was to launch a so-called uh, election uh, pledge, pledge for election integrity, as a kind of a golden standard for elections uh, in the digital age. It was a pledge. Uh, that was signed uh, by political parties and candidates um, to fulfill certain uh, criteria. The pledge includes a number of commitments, for instance, that you will not use data that has been falsified or, or stolen. Uh, you will not spread 
doctored pictures uh, such as uh, deep fakes. Uh, being, you have to be transparent if automated accounts are used to spread messages, and you're transparent about your campaign uh, financing. Uh, so, at the end of the day, the pledge uh, was signed by uh, 180 signatories coming from 21 EU member states and seven political groups of uh, the uh, European Parliament, including all the lead candidates, the so-called spitting candidate. Uh, so I think at the end of the day, it was a great success. Of course, it's not legally binding, but I think it's a bit controversial if you refuse to sign uh, this election pledge. I th- and I think all, all the things in that pledge are very sound or sensible policies. I mean, in, in America, uh, Michael, I remember being in Washington in early 2018, uh, I had a meeting with people in the intelligence community who said that the tech companies know that 2018 midterms, they can't allow any Russian interference, they can't allow any, uh, any interference on social media. Um, I mean, do you, do you think they have been successful in doing all that they need to do to stop foreign interference in American politics? I think we've made progress, <clears throat> um, but of course it's been complicated. So the most obvious forms of interference, <clears throat> which involve impersonating uh, American citizens you know, by people sitting in St. Pete, Petersburg or botnets that affect algorithms. I think a lot of that has been corrected. A lot of the sites have been taken down. Uh, there's a, a, an increasing capability to spot artificially manipulated search results and take those out. But part of what's happened is the adversaries have adjusted to that. In many cases, what they're doing is they are using Americans to become the mouthpiece for the manipulation. And they may amplify a message, but the message may originate from Americans who have extreme ideologies or supporting a particular candidate. And they may use Americans' accounts, legitimate accounts, to propagate things. That creates a challenge for the social media companies because they don't want to be accused of censoring. But at the same time, they recognize that this is simply a thinly veiled effort to continue with this foreign interference. But I always have to say, Damien, to be completely candid, much of the worst disinformation we've had in the 2020 election was domestically generated. Frankly, the Russians could just sit back and watch while we generated false stories and accusations coming from the very top of the U.S. government. And we're continuing to see that now with these you know, preposterous um, postings about widespread fraud in mail-in ballots and at the same time, supposed widespread fraud in the voting machines. And all of this is generated by American citizens, including the President of the United States. And so what we're seeing now is an adaptation of this problem to a much more legally complicated setting where we have to decide how do you counteract deliberate misinformation that is generated and amplified domestically. I think, I think, I think it's right. I mean, the, the Russians don't need to start the fire. They just need to fan the flames. Uh, Correct. And that's what we're seeing. I mean, how do you feel the, well, I suppose on the first point should be, it's the people in politics, senior people should take resp- more responsibility for what they say and not, not uh, allow baseless rumours to, to spread. But if they don't do that, and we've seen President Trump has, has not done that, um, what should the tech companies do? I mean, do you think what they've done has been effective in, in sort of marking postings as being questionable? Do you think they should go further than that? Uh, um, I, you know, I think it's an interesting question. Um, I think the marking in the posting helps, but it doesn't really address the problem of people who are being um, kind of drawn into what we call the rabbit hole by inflammatory material that they just can't resist. And if you look at the media in general, not just social media, one of the things the media has learned over the years is the way you get people to watch is you stimulate anger, fear, or hate. And so appealing to raw emotion um, is something which is a device for getting people more deeply engaged. And of course, engagement as commercial value as well as as political value. So I think the issue here may be 
the algorithms in social media and beginning to adjust the algorithms, at least as it relates to political speech, so that when you click on something, what is recommended to you is not a more intense version of the same thing, but either nothing or something that is much more evenly balanced. That's not a perfect cure, but what it does is it makes it more difficult to lure people into a kind of an echo chamber of extremism, which has been something we've seen not only with, with uh, electoral disinformation, but frankly, terrorist recruiting has used the same technique. So I think, Anders, we've seen many of these problems in, in Europe as well. And there's a, there's a growing debate in Europe, I, I think, I'd say particularly in the UK, now around updating our electoral law to make them sort of fit for the digital age. So the, the rules that apply to what you can do offline apply online as well around the transparency of, uh, of campaigning, understand who the real people are, and where the money comes, comes from. Um, but it also, it also suggests that there need to be some, you know, some standards we expect the tech companies to, to hold. And therefore, it, it begs the question as to whether there should be some sort of regulatory framework which sets standards for the tech companies and how they should act. And I'd be interested in, in your views on that and yours too, Michael. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I think it's, it's a difficult question, actually, because on the one hand, uh, we should do more uh, to counter uh, disinformation, fake news, etc. But on the other hand, we also have a, a precious principle of free speech. Uh, and how to, to strike that balance, that will always be a, a real uh, challenge. Um, I'm not sure that legislation alone will do the job. Uh, but let me uh, use an example. We, we are partnering uh, with uh, a private company called NewsGuard. Uh, NewsGuard is uh, a company uh, consisting of uh, journalists uh, and other media specialists uh, who are watching uh, what is uh, published in different media uh, throughout the day. And they warn users when they view content from what is considered what they consider fake news. Um, and um, uh, the analysis is designed to be transparent. Um, uh, they rank media according to nine criteria. And uh, if, if you fulfill those criteria, you get a green mark. If you do not, you get a red mark. Uh, and then it's for the readers and the listeners and the viewers to make their own uh, judgment. Um, of course, it's not a perfect solution, but I do believe uh, that it is one instrument that could be used uh, to uh, stimulate the critical approach to the news uh, you are confronted with. I, I suppose there's a the question I think that um, Michael you alluded to as well about um, amplification by the by the platform. So it's not. It's not just about misleading content on there, but whether the misleading content is amplified to a greater extent than the reliable information. So people predominantly see misleading information on balance, think, well, that's all anyone seems to be talking about, so there's probably something in it. And do you think in that aspect that there needs to be uh, some standards that we ask the tech companies to work to, that they don't, um, whilst they may allow people to post their opinions, they don't allow their tools to be used to amplify those opinions um, just because they're engaging? I do think so. I think that, you know, unlike content, which at least in the U.S. is, you know, kind of very uh, strongly protected by our free speech rules, I'm not sure that amplification gets the same level of protection. And often amplification is done by taking an element of a story and putting it out front in a way that attracts attention because it's inflammatory in some way. and. Um, so that may be something where I do think putting some standards in, at least as it relates to political topics, might be sensible. Likewise, with hate speech, um, or for example, with um, you know, as we have a vaccine hopefully approaching on COVID, stories that would would amplify the idea that vaccine 
will kill you, vaccine is tainted, are precisely the kinds of things that ought not to be amplified. So I do think we're going to need to take a serious look at amplification and similar algorithmic forms of manipulation as an area that we might impose some standards on. And as a, uh, earlier on in our conversation, you, you mentioned that the, uh, the idea for the Transatlantic Commission came from a, an article written by Joe Biden and a call you had with him. Um, I, I, thought, I was very interested during the presidential campaign that, that Joe Biden was quite outspoken about social media, Facebook in particular, and saying that they shouldn't allow uh, people to spread disinformation through their, through their ad tools um, and that they should do more to combat disinformation. And people in uh, Joe Biden's campaign have been very critical of Facebook's slow response to the Stop the Steal campaign, uh, suggesting mass fraud in the election. How do you think uh, the president elect's incoming administration might start to address some of these issues? Well, maybe Michael <laughs> is better <laughs> equipped to answer that question uh, in, in detail. It remains to be seen, but we do know uh, that uh, Joe Biden is very much uh, focused on this. So I have no doubt uh, that during the first 100 days of his presidency, he will present some proposal as to how um, uh, the, the big uh, tech companies uh, and big media uh, can contribute uh, to countering disinformation um, uh, but which legislation he will present in details, I, I don't know. Uh, but I do know uh, that we can trust him uh, when it comes to a determined effort uh, to, to solve these problems. But as I mentioned before, it's, it's not easy uh, to strike the right balance between countering disinformation on the one hand and on the other hand, ensure. Uh, free speech. And right now, there's a lot of discussion in the U.S. Congress uh, on the issue of the tech companies. And to be honest, there's a fair amount of hostility. Some of it is that the companies are too big. Um, on the on the uh, conservative side, there are people who think that the tech companies censor right wing voices. Um, on the Liberal side, there are people who believe the tech companies allow right-wing voices too much amplification. Um, there's discussions about liability protections that the tech companies currently enjoy for content. So I do think that we need to be uh, careful in exactly how we implement change. And one thing I would say is this. I don't know that I would want to see the government in the position of having the final word on, you know, the way tech companies deal with content. Because if you look at the past administration, I don't think that I would have been comfortable having Donald Trump be able to go thumbs up or thumbs down on content, because you can only imagine what the content would have looked like. So, you know, one of the great lessons of the last four years, I think, for Americans is that the guardrails that we build in our you know, human rights, uh, you know, sometimes it may seem uh, uh, maybe unnecessarily severe because we believe that most people are going to, you know, play by the ethical rules anyway. But the last four years have shown sometimes you need those guardrails. And so you have to be careful that you don't enlarge the government's power to the point that when you get people who don't respect the norms, you start to have a real problem. Yeah. I was reading recently about the um President Franklin Roosevelt's creation of the Federal um, Communications Commission. And in the, you know, at a time of radio in the 30s, when it was seen as a very powerful media and recognizing that you wanted to make sure that different political voices had equal access to it, that there wasn't too much foreign ownership or monopoly ownership. It wasn't, they weren't seeking to regulate speech, but they recognized this was a very pa powerful new media and there should be some, some, some rules of the road to make sure that, that that power wasn't abused. And to me, it seems like we need something similar for all the tech world now. Well, we had, you know, in the U.S. until until cable television dramatically expanded, there was something called the Fairness Doctrine. If you were a broadcaster, and there were only a you know, relatively small number of television networks, you had an obligation to air both, you know, different sides of an issue, 
with relative degree of equality, and there were other standards in place. Now, when cable television expanded, that doctrine was abolished because people said, well, there are so many different outlets, people will always get hurt. But I don't think what they anticipated was the use of artificial intelligence, information gathering, and algorithms as a way of so focusing and concentrating messages that that itself would have a distorting effect on the way messages were received. You know, you can, you know, literally speak out of both sides of your mouth now because you can tell one targeted group one thing, another targeted group the opposite, and both sides won't understand they've only been getting half the story. So again, that's another issue we need to look at carefully. Yeah. Anders, in, in Europe, I mean, there's been a lot of work done by the governments in, in France and Germany on this and by the European Commission and institutions. Do you think there will be uh, moves to establish new regulations around social media content in Europe? Yes, I think we, I think we will see a new uh, legislation. But again, I be, <laughs> though I, I consider this a major problem uh, and a real challenge, I belong to the camp that is also uh, cautioning against too much legislation. I fully agree with Michael Chertoff that it would be a dangerous path uh, to hand over more competences uh, to the government uh, in in that respect. Uh, That would really politicize uh, uh, the flow of uh, news. Uh, And uh, of course, there are certain issues where you objectively is able to um, conclude that this is fake. But you also have other issues where it's not that obvious. And if the government uh, gets uh, the responsibility to decide, then I think uh, we risk uh, um, a restriction in free speech that I would not be prepared to accept. So I think we will see new legislation, but I would caution against too much legislation. I think the private sector, the big tech companies uh, should um, take care of those issues themselves. I'm very pleased that we're joined again by Charles Creel on the podcast. Charles is a a bit of a transatlantic week himself, but his feet are now <laughs> firmly back on the European side of the ocean. Uh, what's caught your attention in the last few days, Charles? Um, well, it's interesting um, watching the aftermath of the election in the United States, uh, and I, we, and hoping rather that it's an aftermath of the election. Um, but disinformation is still going out in um, some states where uh, the message has come from the very top that, in fact. Um, the the vote is disputed when it's not. Um, but what's really interested me in listening to this uh, conversation, Damien, um, I've just had a couple of questions that have come up that I'm curious about for both uh, Michael and Anders. Um, I'm, you've, you've both said that before 2016, we weren't really aware of this problem or the severity of the problem. Um, and I'm wondering, that's that kind of falls in that category of unknown unknowns. And it makes me wonder if there isn't something that we're not aware of now that we should be very concerned about. How can we look toward the, toward the future and what kind of interference might be coming in in elections? Well, I can begin. Um, so first of all, I would say even prior to 2016, we knew that there were information operations mounted by the Russians and influence operations, and this has been going on for decades. I just think that there was a period of time, uh, you know, after the fall of the Soviet Union, that we just discounted um, the degree to which this could be a threat to the unity of effort, both among Western countries and even within Western countries. So it wasn't so much that it was an unknown issue, it was an underappreciated issue. I think that actually the thing we're seeing now, which is troubling, and I think will be part of what we need to continue to look at, is we had been thinking about election integrity as protecting against efforts to affect the vote before the vote is cast. 
with propaganda or undermining people's willingness to uh, you know, actually go to the polls. What we're now seeing is after the election, efforts to attack the integrity of the election and to attack the legitimacy of the elected officials. And that is something which is not going to end and hasn't ended with the tallying of the votes, but it may continue for a considerable period of time as part of a general effort on the part of our um, adversaries overseas to erode the confidence and belief in institutions, which are the foundation of democracy. You know, one of the things the commission heard yesterday in a discussion with people who've been monitoring the election in Taiwan <clears throat> is that the our Chinese Communist Party on the mainland focuses a lot of disinformation efforts at telling Taiwanese and other uh, international actors that democracy doesn't work, it's inefficient, it's corrupt, and that only a top-down authoritarian managed government really can deliver for the people. This is not a message that is only going to be geared to the electoral cycle, but it's going to be an effort to undermine our democracy on an ongoing basis. I, um, I agree with, with Michael. Let me just add to this. I think we will see um, further development of, of technology. Uh, I think uh, what we call deep fake technology will be further advanced. A couple of years ago, we produced a so-called deep fake video with uh, President Trump. Uh, uh, and we uh, showed him in uh, three editions, a true Trump, a Trump uh, where an actor pretended to speak like Trump, and thirdly, uh, a machine uh, that spoke like uh, Trump. And then we presented it to an audience, and it was not possible for people to distinguish. They couldn't decide who was the true Trump and who wasn't. Uh, and since then, the technology has been further developed. And we do know that if people are watching a video, uh, it, it looks much more credible than if they are just presented with some information. And I think in that respect, we will see a further step uh, that will require further action from our side. You're, you're talking about um, the post-Soviet era and the end of the Cold War as being a moment when the way we looked at these things shifted. And indeed, historically, um, we might have been looking to our security services to monitor these kinds of things, foreign election interference, massive propaganda fake media with with presidential figures and so on. Why are we now relying on big tech for this? Can we not rely on security services? Um, you know, I think security services can be of value, but again, I think sometimes they get swept up in some of the skepticism and even cynicism that we see you know, permeating Western democracies and leading to a loss of trust. And by the way, Exhibit A, is Donald Trump, who has consistently rejected the warnings of his own security services and said that they're part of the deep state. So I do think in a funny way, a public-private partnership has more credibility than a purely government effort. Yeah, okay. I, I agree. Um, but of course, there will be issues that can be dealt with with security services in the most efficient way, of course. But I I, I do believe that private-public uh, partnership or cooperation here is the right way uh, forward. And uh, to a, I think to a large degree, uh, we will have to base ourselves and the actions uh, on um, uh, what we could self-responsibility uh, among the private actors. And just one more question for me. What do we do with a situation like Parler? which has been set up very specifically to be partisan. Um, it's been in, invested in early on by the Mercers. Um, it seems like we're not going to get a lot of cooperation there in creating, having a balanced dialogue within it. And the reaction we might get from them might be very different than, say, from a Facebook, even though that's not ideal, or a Twitter. Um, what do you all think about that? Let, let me try this. So I recognize 
and this has always been true, you, it, you will always get fringe uh, media that are very focused on a particular ideology and have a narrow band of people who watch it. Um, that's been a feature of free speech and communication for as long as history records it. What I think is important is the people who sign on to that have already made a decision about how they want to curate their news. They only want to hear things that subscribe to their point of view. That's true with some of the cable television we have in the U.S. What I think is important is to differentiate between that and broad-based platforms that purport to be welcoming to a large population, but then can be manipulated or will manipulate in order to drive people who sign on into a particular slot or a particular rabbit hole. So to me, if we can differentiate between broad-based media that holds itself open to everybody and have them abide by certain standards, we accept the fact that people who are already deeply invested in a particular ideological viewpoint will find alternative media sources. But again, they won't scale. They'll be relatively narrow and their impact will be relatively um, small. Now, I should hasten to add, even for them, there are limits. Uh, incitement to violence, for example, is illegal, um, whether it's a broad-based platform or a narrow platform. Child pornography is illegal. But it's it's a, a different set of standards, I think, that apply in that instance. If I could um, just, just come in with a just a final question for me. I mean, the Transland Commission was set up to look at election interference, and we'd probably say that as democracies, interference in elections is one of the most serious sort of communication challenges we could face. But we've got a different challenge coming up now, which is uh, not party political, uh, but important to the world. And that's the delivery of the COVID vaccine. And, and I, I think sometimes with politics, people hold their own political beliefs. They might say, well, I would never be persuaded of, sort of a different opinion just because I've seen something on Facebook. But I think what we've seen this year is that people can be led to, led to believe medical conspiracy theories around something new like COVID that can influence the way they behave. And it's going to be very important for the world now that we've almost got these vaccines uh, ready to be deployed, that people have confidence in them. And this would seem to be a, a moment for the, the tech companies to demonstrate the social responsibility they can take to make sure that the, the vaccine program isn't undermined by disinformation. And I'd welcome any thoughts you have on that before we close. Yeah, but I, I fully agree. Uh, that is, of course, essential. But it's uh, very much for the medical companies to, uh, to, um, to get their message uh, through. Uh, still, uh, I think it should be voluntary uh, if people want uh, to be vaccinated. Uh, whether they believe or not believe, uh, the medical companies sets up uh, for them. Uh, and, but gradually we can reopen societies and people, uh, are, if people are willing to run the risk not to be vaccinated, it's their case uh, and their responsibility. So um, uh, I agree uh, that also in this case we should counter disinformation, but at the end of the day it is a private responsibility. Do you have any thoughts on that, Michael? No, I, I agree, although I will say that the platforms have indicated that they will take down, you know, obviously false statements. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that to the extent that, you know, it's a question of evaluating personal risk, I agree with Anders. In the end, people have to judge for themselves, bearing in mind that if you're not vaccinated, that may impose additional travel restrictions or restrictions on, for example, your ability to go to work. I think you're going to have to consider as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, Anders for Rasmussen, Michael Chodoff, thank you both so much for joining us on the podcast. It's been great to talk to you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to the Infotagion podcast, hosted by me, Damien Collins, featuring Anders for Rasmussen, Michael Chertoff, and Charles Creel. It was produced by Lucy and David Dargahi. You can find out more about Infotagion the independent COVID-19 fact-checking service recommended by Ofcom and send us examples of disinformation you've seen by visiting our website, infotagion.com 
or using hashtag isolate the lies on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. You can also support this show by becoming a Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Infotagion podcast. Infotagion is a not-for-profit organisation and all the proceeds will go towards the making of this podcast. Thank you. Until next time.